So before we start, can we have you say and spell your name? Sure, it is Meredith Gotts, and it's M-E-R-E-D-I-T-H, and the last name is Gotts, G-O-T-Z. Awesome. So we are at Foothills Brewing in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, for an interview uh, for Wellcrafted NC. Today is Tuesday, July 31st. Uh, so to start off, Meredith, can we talk about just a little bit about your background and how you got here? I got into brewing. Um, well, I basically got into craft beer heavily when I moved down to Miami. Before that, I was going to a, a tiny little local um, craft beer and boutique wine bar um, called the Kilted Mermaid, where I lived in Vero Beach. And the selection of beers there varied so significantly. We were getting things like Bell's um, Two Hearted, we could get Hop Slam, Dogfish 120, a lot of really hard to find beers. I was used to going home with, uh, you know, Newcastle Brown and like playing some Tiger Woods golf. <laughs> so started trying a bunch of different craft beers, ended up graduating with my uh, degree in elementary education, and I got a job down in uh, Homestead, Florida. So I went down there and uh, quickly realized that there was no craft beer scene. <laughs> this was uh, like 2013. Uh, so of course, you know, my mom calls and is like, what's wrong? Because I'm crying on the phone and I'm sitting in a bar and I said, the only craft beer they have is Blue Moon. Uh, so kind of heartbroken about that. But I ended up going kind of on a blind date with an engineer from Cigar City who had a mobile canning company. And we would go around um, South Florida canning beer for all of these breweries that weren't quite ready to make the purchase. Um, so it was a great way to get a lot of local breweries into um, distribution. I ended up canning beer at a brewery that was basically in my backyard in Homestead. And, you know, being a teacher, you don't really get to interact with anybody over the age of, I worked at a charter school, so nobody over the age of 18, really, the whole week. And I wasn't a club girl, you know, I just, I'd sit at home with my dog. Um, so I did miss bartending, and I was like, well, let me, you know, I asked if I could start beer tending for them on the weekends. Uh, two months into beer tending on the weekends, I'm giving tours, talking about the brewing process, and they asked me if I would like to learn how to brew beer and work for them full time. Um, what was the name of this brewery? Miami Brewing Company, yeah. So I was there for almost two years and helped them actually come into distribution here in North Carolina. I drove a 33-foot RV um, from Miami. <laughs> all the way up here to North Carolina. And uh, we introduced our beer to North Carolina at the very first um, beer camp at Sierra Nevada. So it was really interesting to be set up next to breweries like Mother Earth. Um, there was Pisca, Catawba was there. Um, but really be like one of the only Florida breweries present and have people try our beers. Um, we used a lot of different uh, flavors, like tropical flavors. We'd have a car coconut caramel cream ale. We would do a mango um, wheat beer called shark bait. So, um, you know, but we really wanted that tropical flavor to kind of come through. I ended up leaving uh, Miami Brewing and I have a best friend that lives up here now. I've known her for like 13 years and uh, we met down in Florida. So she's been up here for about five years and I called her and I said, I know I was gonna move up in like a year, but I just left my job and I got this paycheck. And in the background, her husband yells, come on up. <laughs> so I basically took a day to pack everything into my tiny little Jeep and drive up here to North Carolina. And I was you know, working in a couple of restaurants to start, um, ended up getting a job as a beer explorer with All About Beer magazine. Uh, Really interesting doing uh, tasting samples of like Devil's Backbone when they were still independent in a supermarket and people immediately will grab the lightest thing on the table and you're like, wait, do you like hops? <laughs> you know? uh, so I really kind of learned a little bit of how to approach people and explain it more on the level of, well, darling, I don't really drink beer. I'm more of a wine drinker. Oh, well, then you would like this. Uh, 
But Foothills was a place that, you know, I had visited the first time I was here in Winston and even washing kegs down in Miami, I would get MicroStar kegs with like Foothills, you know, tape. And I'm like, oh, that beer sounds delicious. I was like, I'm going to work there one day, you know, and I would see it all the time. And um, I applied. I saw they had a brewery position open and, uh, you know, my boss, Teal, has always said, you've been very persistent, you know, about wanting to work here. Um, so that's pretty much how I ended up here at Foothills, was just continuously knocking on the door and being like, I'm here, you, the jobs don't need to be filled, you know? Um, and what, what year was that when you- That was, I, so I finally actually got on payroll and started here uh, <laughs> March, 2016. Okay. Yeah, so I mean, I moved up here November, 2015. So over the course of like three or four months, you know, I, my resume was at Small Batch and Wise Man hadn't even opened yet. Um, but like Hoots, anywhere here in Winston, I was like, please hire me, please hire me. <laughs> but yeah, it was, yeah. Uh, it was interesting going into Foothills and I went into the pub uh, and I was just talking to the bartender and I was like, hey, I heard you guys are hiring for a brewer. And then uh, somebody was like, oh, well, do you bartend? I said, are you guys hiring? They were like, oh, do you bartend? And I said, no, I brew. And there were actually like four or five employees that were like working in the lab or they were brewers sitting at the bar a little bit down and you just see heads go. <laughs> Which is brewer. Okay, cool. And then one of them actually walked over and like introduced himself and I was like, okay, this is kind of cool. So yeah, yeah so that's how I ended up working in a foothills. <laughs> Very cool. Yeah. So like when you first got started in brewing, were you pretty much self-taught or trained in Miami, I guess? Yeah, I was trained in Miami. Um, I did a lot of reading on my own. Um, they hired me to kind of replace, there were two guys brewing there before and I would go and hang out with them all the time. Um, and one of them, um, his name was Matthew Weintraub. He actually uh, started the tank down in Miami. Um, they just won gold for their saison um, at the, not the Great American, but I think it was like the World Beer Championship. So I was like so proud because I saw them form that beer. But um, there was a huge, I mean, besides Matthew helping me a little bit, there was a huge uh, language barrier because I don't speak Spanish fluently, but everybody at the brewery did. Uh, and not English fluently. <laughs> so I'm trying to learn all these scientific terms and why this is happening and also deal with the Spanish language barrier. Um, so a lot of it was kind of like, okay, tell me how to do it. And then you would do the first two steps and go back, okay, tell me again, what do you want done? <laughs> um, and a lot of it too was just kind of listening to myself. I've always been into cooking and science has always been like a big love of mine. Um, so I kind of know what things should taste like. Um, and when they weren't tasting right, I would be like, hey, you know, let's check this out. But I started a sensory program there. Um, we weren't keeping track of any of our cans and seeing how they aged out. So I was doing vertical tasting. So that checking uh, the carbonation levels of the beer. Um, as well as starting beer dinners. We were kind of out in the middle of nowhere. So, you know, somebody has to drive like 20 minutes to get to us, but it, it was a beautiful spot. We had waterfalls and everything else. Um, but doing beer dinners to educate people on craft beer because there wasn't really anybody else around to do it. And now you look at Miami's beer scene and it's blown up and I'm really happy to see that, you know? Uh, but yeah, I pretty much learned everything as far as washing kegs and filling those flavoring kegs the whole brewing process and we were completely manual so there's no there's no pumps we didn't even have a hot liquor tank that was self-heating uh going through and noticing that some things were antiquated uh we had a boiler that needed to be replaced and just being really hard up and pressing you know the owners and saying listen you want the best product possible this is what we have to do to continue brewing um learning how to work on a canning line, which was really interesting for me. We had a 20 head fill system. Um, you know, Ball, who used to make uh, the mason jars, they actually went into the canning business. So we got all of our cans from Ball, and they would be on these huge pallets, and you just have to pull the sheet 
and the cans would slide into place, you know, but making sure all those were filled properly and just, it's a lot of work. And we were still a very small um, group. I think total there was like five of us working, you know? Wow. So it's a lot of time. I mean, easily doing 40 plus hours. And when your salary, I was, you know, doing 40 hours in the brewery and then working bar on the weekends to give tours and educate people on, you know, the process of craft beer. So yeah. pretty much did everything there. Yeah. Um, so you, you mentioned doing a lot of reading. Can you, yeah. can you think of the like specific resources maybe that you drew on to grow as a brewer, to learn? Um, a lot of the books, I mean, it's hilarious because I got into brewing without even doing home brewing before. So when you think of home brewing, you immediately think of the joy of home brewing. So try Babazan number one, um, John Palmer, uh, reading a lot of like the Brewmaster's Bible. Um, as I kind of like started advancing a little bit more, you'd get into like the Water Hops yeast books. Right now, even self-reading, um, I'm going through the Lewis and Young, like really college level text of brewing that involves chemistry and everything else. Um, but anything that was on a Barnes and Noble bookshelf, anything that if I walked into a homebrew store and said, that looks very detailed, you know, you just grab the book. Yeah. Uh, definitely. Yeah. And so, you know, in addition to, I guess, books, were there specific people that, that you can kind of pinpoint as folks who were kind of important to, to your growth or maybe that served as mentors as you yeah. were going through? Uh, I had mentioned Matt Weintraub, so definitely probably one of the most influential uh, brewers that I worked with down in Miami. Um, he and his partner Mo, when I talk about the detail and the level of like scientific specificity that they went through just even designing that Saison, you're weighing out hops by like the gram, like one little pellet, and I mean you have six or seven different words divided into pony kegs and you're dosing each one with like a tiny little amount or how much carbonation should we add to the beer? You know, he brought beer making onto a very scientific, you know, where I feel like a lot of brewers like kind of know how it's supposed to taste and I plugged it into the recipe machine. Let's just run with it, you know? And that's a beautiful side of brewing, but um, Matt's guidance is very more of a scientific, like use all your notes because if you keep great notes you're going to be able to replicate that beer over and over again um that was probably my biggest influence down in miami and then when i came up here um once i got involved with foothills uh tl who's our head brewmaster just i mean foothills is known for being ipas you know but every single ipa for the most part that i've had is so different and when you think of base grains for most IPAs are very similar and it's just the hops that you're playing with whether you're double or triple dry hopping in or when you're adding them or you know what amounts uh, can give you such an array of, of differences um, that really kind of opened my eyes so you don't have to add 17 different specialty malts to make the beer different you know you can just change it up subtly um, and that's been really important so whenever I've thought about beers that I would like to brew, I um, completely go back to just kind of keep it simple and let the individual ingredients really shine. Um, and then also, just as far as the teaching goes, you know, it's very much like, what do you want to learn? You know, we'll, we'll teach it to you if you want to learn it and show proficiency in it. So yeah. I, I really enjoy the fact that anybody that for the most part I've come up to that like talk to me about, you know, carving with nitrogen, you know, do a beer mix, do this. Um, also, you have a lot of uh, homebrew forums like on Prober and stuff like that. And it's just kind of reading for information and weeding out some of the crazier ideas and okay, this is fact, this is fiction kind of thing. But um, yeah, those two gentlemen have helped me immensely. And then I recently got really involved in Pink Boots and I, um, I honestly feel like that uh, group of women has kept me sane enough to continue in the beer industry. And, uh, you know, one in particular, Anita Riley, as far as like asking her for advice and through different situations has been immensely helpful. So, yeah, yeah those are probably my top three. Yeah. <laughs> 
So uh, thinking about the brewing process, what's your favorite part of just brewing? Oh God, um, I kind of love all of it. Um, brewing for me is, you know, even though it's super hot up there, it is such a sensory kind of like nerdy. I get to be sciencey, and here's all my mash numbers and I understand the pH levels, but then the smell when you're mashing in and the grain, you're just like, Oh man. <laughs> um, but then as I'm dropping hops, like hops is one of my favorite things and you just can't help but like smell a bucket and be like, yes, this smells so good. Um, as you're adding everything in, I've kind of gotten to see the other side working in the lab, but I mean, even looking at the barrels as we're aging beer, uh, knowing that, hey, this barrel looks a little bit different from this one. It's going to impart a different flavor into the beer, but we're going to blend it all anyway, so it's all good. Um, and adding a lot of different fruits, and we're doing, you know, quite a few barrel-aged things here. Um, but I think the whole process overall, as far as, like, brewing is, is my favorite. You know, people are like, clean up has got to suck, and I was like, it doesn't. You know, you turn on some music, and you zone out, and you're going to clean for four or five hours. And sometimes you do that for a full eight, but it's, I would never be good behind a desk. Um, you know, I realized that after teaching, I was like, I need to move. Uh, and even on my bad days when I'm really sore, it's just getting in there and just sweating and doing your job. It really does, you know, kind of take your mind off of like anything else that could possibly be going on. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, I mean, every aspect of it between the science side of it to just sitting at the bar, you know, four weeks later and trying something that you had a hand in is, is my favorite part, honestly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, one of the things that you talked about a little bit, you know, you had your education background, but it sounds like you are still doing lots of education related things yeah. with brewing. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about like how those two fit together, how you see the education component, component and teaching people about beer tying into the brewing that you do? Oh yeah. Um, I always, two things that I've always said is when you stop learning, you stop growing. And that um, to get somebody to really partake and become active and supportive of the craft beer revolution, if you want to call it, or the scene, is to educate them on what we're about. We're not the, well, forget you, Coors and, you know, Bush and all, ugh, you should only drink this. If you drink any of that, that you're an awful person. I can't, I can't stand that. The biggest issue is you have not taken that person who likes those beers and shown them a craft beer equivalent that is just tasty and makes you want to come back and say, I would drink a case of that because that's delicious. And that's on you to do that. Um, one of my favorite things was doing the beer exploring was to take those people who had a case of Bud Light and they would try a Vienna Lager and be like, that is smooth. I, okay. And they would put it back and I was like, yes. And that's the thing. It's not to shun people because they don't know better. It's to welcome them into your field and say, let me teach you a little something, you know? Um, and I feel like I do that all the time whenever I'm giving somebody a tour and one of the biggest, uh, I guess, compliments is when they're like, I learned so much, you know? And that twinkle that you see in somebody's eye when they're like, oh, like all of a sudden you're like, okay, cool, you get it now. Um, but yeah, to give somebody a tour or to talk to, you know, a guy who's new brewing on our system and well why do we have the water temp like this you know or why are we you know using these malts or drop or adding salt at this time to to kind of tell them why it's the best reason they're like oh, okay and it just makes them a better person you know um i think the more educated people craft beer wise that we have out there the easier it will be for people to accept when you're like hey I just released this double dry hop with this hop it's a rare hop you know <laughs> they're like okay now I see what you did um, but I love how both of them have always crossed over for me and I love training people or even just talking to them because I think one of the things about education is you learn the material yourself first and then you find a better way of teaching that person so they grasp the concept. Um, 
and just kind of learning how that person learns. You know, some are like, here's the SOP, I know you can read it, go. And then others are like, please show me which valve to open and how much chemical I should add, you know, step by step. Uh, but once you figure that out, you can reach them on any level. Uh, so I, I honestly feel that education and brewing is such a married relationship. Uh, because, I mean, I think brewing as a whole, I don't think every single person went out there and invented how to brew beer. Somebody taught somebody else how to do that, you know? And then somebody figured out how to do it better and they taught that person how to do it better. So yeah. that's, it's educating and beer drinking goes hand in hand. <laughs> yeah, and I think, you know, some of that ties into the, you know, I think you, you, you talked about kind of bringing someone from big beer and introducing them to craft beer. Yeah. And then once they get into craft beer, there's educating them on the different styles. Can you talk about like, how, how do you go about kind of teaching someone who kind of has taken the craft beer, or at least dipped their toe into craft beer, yeah. um, and, and broadening, broadening their horizons? Um, I guess like probably one of the easiest examples that I use, it was one that even I had to go through. Um, you don't have many, <laughs> big beer drinkers going over to craft beer and immediately jumping on the IPA bandwagon and saying, I love IPAs. Like, they're never like that. Uh, maybe some, but not everybody. Usually it's like a lager that kind of brings them on board because it's something they're relatable to. And the first time you say, well, I think you should try this IPA, you get that, like, look at disgust on their face. I don't like this. Um, and then the first question I always ask them is, is it too, piney does it taste like you're licking an air freshener or you know the bitterness and you kind of like pick apart like what's your hate relationship with the hops you know and then once you find out what it is whether it's an IBU factor or it's just the type of hop that was in there you can suggest something that you know they're gonna like um, and that moment when they try a beer style that they're like I hate this beer and they're like oh man that's really good you know, you're like, see, I told you. And that's kind of what happened with me. You know, I had a lot of really heavily hopped, like, you know, 98 IBU, like IPAs. And I was like, I can't drink this. And then I started going into some various, you know, New England, not New England, <laughs> IPAs, but I like more citrusy, you know, kind of hops, which is like why I love Jade. Um, or hop job. It's just very grapefruit and give me some lemon in there, you know, something crisp, something light. But we can go as dark and dank as you want. Um, just tell me which threshold is, you know, or even people, oh my God, another big one too is color. They immediately think that color dictates your flavor. And I said, that's so not the case. And I said, don't judge a beer by its color. <laughs> Uh, and I immediately explain, you know, the SRM factor to them, but it's basically just like making a cup of coffee. You know, some people like their coffee black and then other people like it with a little milk. I like mine with a lot of milk. <laughs> uh, so much so it's probably just a splash of coffee in there. It's fine. But the malts and when you smell them, you realize, oh, that's where I get my chocolate. That's where I get my coffee from. Um, that's where I get caramel. Oh my God, a bag of C20 opened up that's been newly roasted. It smells like beautiful caramel and you don't even want to wear the mask. You just want to smell it. But it's like those grains are giving the beer the flavor, not the heavy thickness that you're, you're imparting uh, and introducing people to that as well. And I think um, I love beer dinners for that reason. You know, you're not necessarily forcing somebody to drink a whole pint of beer that they hate, but you're also pairing it with a food that they're like, all right, at least the chocolate's awesome if I don't drink the beer, you know? But when you do marry the two together, you're like, but now I see how it's such an awesome idea if you have both of them together. Uh, so I really do feel like that is, you know, a really easy way to kind of like help bridge that gap and get people over to just play around with it, get samples. Almost every bar does a flight or a sample glass you know, if you're not comfortable with, um, you know, a new style, totally ask. The mass majority of breweries I've gone to have some of the most educated beer tenders, and a lot of them have their level one, if not level two, Cicerone. Um, 
let them kind of like share their knowledge and teach you something because then you're just continuing that education craft beer, you know, beautifulness that yeah. seems going. Yeah. So speaking of styles and trends from a brewer's perspective, <laughs> okay. Uh, do you have particular styles or trends that you are either really in love with and hope continue for forever or that you would not cry if they went away? I like, so when you sent me the questions, you know, immediately it's like, ah, oh, glitter beer or uh, super sour beers, you know. Um, there's a threshold. I think everybody's pH level. <laughs> and once you start going below that, physically it's unpleasant to drink those beers. And those are the kids that would like shove five lemon heads in their mouth and walk around like it's the best day. Not me. Um, I, but to be honest with you, I feel that um, the beautiful part about craft beer is there's so many different people who love different types of beer. Some are like, give me the most experimental thing you got on draft. And then others are like, I like your Pilsner, that's all I want to drink. And that is fine. Um, let a brewery be experimental, you know? Um, I doubt we would have as many styles as we do today if somebody didn't step outside the box and say, let me try this instead. Let me open fermentation in this field back here and see what I get, you know? We wouldn't have that if somebody didn't just think outside the box. Um, I had a conversation recently with a bunch of friends because there was a beer that came across that had activated charcoal in it. It was activated charcoal and glitter. <laughs> and while it looks cool, I feel that there are, um, we have a responsibility as brewers to be very um, non-withholding about ingredients that have a possibility to lessen the effects of your medication or could possibly cause you an allergic reaction. Um, and a lot of that is like, hey, we used peanuts or there's shellfish in this, um, things like that. Being very forthcoming, um, I think we have that responsibility to be responsible and say, this is what I put in there. If you're allergic to it, please don't drink this beer. Uh, and then I feel like you're just covering your butt because you're telling them up front, like, yeah, there's shellfish in here. There's something wrong with that. I'd rather tell somebody what's in my beer than have them have an anaphylactic reaction at my bar. Uh, so I really do honestly feel like be as crazy as you want. Um, there's gonna be somebody out there who's gonna drink it. If it's a one-off, it's a one-off, who cares? You know, it's a beautiful part. Favorite thing about working on a Sabco machine is somebody may never have this again or somebody may want a bunch of it again. Uh, but go crazy, but be responsible. Yeah. You know, um, I, for me, I will continue to drink IPAs. <laughs> the day I, I, it's, uh, I just recently found out, so like I love Saisons and Belgians and all of that, but I had a, uh, an interesting allergic reaction to, I'm sure you're familiar with Hunapu from Cigar City. Um, the year that they had that ticket mishap with Eventbrite where all of these false tickets got out and they ran out of Hunapu, they did a 70 brewer collaboration commemorative bottle like the following year. And when I say 70 breweries, it's like, oh, well, Duck Rabbit sprinkled the yeast in, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but they decided to use Trappist yeast. And I took a sip of the beer, and I mean, really one sip, and all of a sudden this all got real red and itchy, and I just, <laughs> I think I'm allergic to that yeast strain. <laughs> so I'm finding like really, really, really old <laughs> yeast strains, and I do not get along for some reason. Um, so I've been very weary of Belgians, <laughs> and even some Saisons. Um, the fact that I'll drink a beer and I could tell you like, oh, it's a German Hefeweizen and I immediately am getting a headache from this, you know? It's a little weird, it's a little helpful though too when you're doing blind tastings, you're like, I know what style that is. Um, but yeah, just be forthcoming because we all have these weird things in our body like allergies and uh, I'm dealing with one myself right now. <laughs> yeah. It kind of cuts down on your drinkability of like, things that you can do. Uh, Shimei is definitely out now. <laughs> yeah, which is a shame. Yeah, oh yeah. No, I love Shimei. It's awesome. So, thinking about just the brewing industry as a whole. Yeah. Where do you see the industry going over the next five or ten years? Um, 
I'm sure other people have said this to you, but I honestly see it toning down from really big mega breweries. Um, Foothills is huge. I mean, we're five states. But there's only so many production breweries you can have that can saturate the market. Um, you know, before Prohibition and the World Wars, a lot of towns just had their local brewery. And um, one of the things I loved about Winston, I mean, I live pretty close to downtown where I can walk. If I want to go uphill, you know, I'm downtown in five minutes if I walk. And the number of little places or, or breweries that I can walk to is fantastic. And that's really where I see it kind of heading, you know. Um, I think if you stay small, if you're not wanting to do I want to do 60,000 barrels. Like, no, just, just do like 5,000 barrels, you know. Make it limited releases. That's the biggest thing now is people aren't necessarily concerned about price. If it's a great brewery and it's a limited release and it's a one-time run, they will show up. You know, you, you brew it, they will come um, kind of mentality. And I love the quality over quantity aspect of it. Um, so I really do see breweries slowing down or rechanging their growth plans to only really include, you know, maybe just in the triad. You know, forget using these large distributors and make a killing off of it. I mean, you have Joy Mongers who doesn't distribute and yet you just opened a barrel hall. So there's something to be said to just attracting people to your location. And I think it also gets you to step outside of the, the texting box for a minute and sit across from your friend and have a beer. Uh, it's, it's a social hall, it's a gathering place, it's not a sit on your couch with a headset and play video games for 12 hours kind of thing. Uh, I mean, social media even blows up when it comes to craft beer and like I said, I've, you know, we talk about hazy IPAs, I'm in the Colorado, New England IPA haze craze group and just the pictures that they post and you're like, that looks beautiful, you know, uh, sharing with strangers halfway across the country and over what? Over a beer. You know, um, I think that's going to continue as far as people are going to get more involved in their city and their town and the people that they live around because they're all going to go to the same little bars and areas and support your local community. You know, yeah. so I would love to see it stay on a smaller, you know, citywide scale than than blow up. You don't need 55 million giant breweries. <laughs> It's a great way to hire people, but you can have six or seven little breweries in your town and still find every single one of them packed if they're doing it right, you know? Yeah, and I think that ties in with the education you were talking about earlier too. Absolutely. I mean, you don't get the education when you're buying the beer from a brewery on the other side of the country from the grocery store. No, and I mean, I've never gone to like Miller or Coors or any of those places and walked in and said like, show me your place, you know, and I don't know if they would be so forthcoming to be like, absolutely, let me show you everything. Where it's like here, we're like, you want to go on a tour? Come on, let's put some safety glasses on. You know, three o'clock during the weekend, you get like 20 people walking through <laughs> wanting to check out the space. Uh, yeah, so like, let's be open about what we're doing and we want to share it with you and like, this is who we are, you know? I love yeah. that. Yeah, so let's talk a little bit about Foothills. Okay. You, you've talked about some of these things already. How would you kind of, how do you define like the main mission of Foothills or the theme for Foothills? I mean, I think with Foothills being really the first brewery here in, in Winston, um, you know, and the fact that we've gone from that tiny little pub space to this, um, it kind of says a little bit about the dedication of like Jamie and TL and, and the owners for their, you know, commitment to making excellent beers. Um, you know, I work in a lab and for an independent craft brewery to have as high tech of a lab as we do, they really care about the quality of the product that's going out their door. Uh, at the same time, you know, while we introduce like the big IPAs to everybody here, I, I kind of think that, you know, Wise Man and Incendiary and Hoots and all those guys probably paid a little bit of part into us going a little bit outside of, you know, just IPAs, you know, barrel aging more things, adding fruit to more things. And, uh, 
you know, people were really worried when those breweries started opening up, like, what's going to happen to Foothills? I said, they're going to be challenged and they're going to rise to the occasion. Um, but I mean, between the huge events that Foothills has here, I think our biggest goal is just to really bring the community of Winston-Salem, if, if not North Carolina, beer people together. I mean, Jamie, through sitting on, you know, the, the brewmaster's uh, table and everything else, like with all of those guys, it's it's all about like bring people together educate support and expand you know make north carolina a great brewing state so i think foothills has definitely accomplished that um, for sure yeah <laughs> yeah so when you came here this space hadn't opened yet is that right it was open it was open so the move had already taken place the move had already taken place um i believe it was 2014 they moved okay. over here uh, and it's really hard for me to think because I started out working in the pub and it was just me and another brewer. There were two of us. And I was like, how many people used to work back here? And he would be like, you know, eight people, six people. And I'm like, with a forklift and brewing and this, I'm like, I would hate somebody. You know, I see some breweries and they're so tiny. I couldn't imagine like having that many people working in tight space. You really have to love your, <laughs> your co-workers. Yeah. So how many, how many folks do y'all have now? Oh my God, total number. Um, so Ballpark if you need to. <sighs> okay, so we'll bring it down by brewing and production. Um, we run 24 hours a day during the week, um, usually up until like Wednesday or Thursday, depending on what our schedule is. You'll always have uh, two brewers slash cellarmen working, so three shifts, so that's six. Um, Plus myself, who was the assistant brewer. So it was like seven, now I'm moving into a brewing position. So back to six. Um, our production line, now you probably have between six to eight people per shift. And those guys during the week, they run 12 hour shifts. Yeah, so some weeks they're working like six to six. Uh, that's super hardcore. I worked on the production line for a bit here too. I mean, when we talk about uh, trained pretty much on everything like that's that's where i'm at um and then we have three ladies in the lab and then our office staff and yeah. then all the sales crew and everything else so yeah what you see back here i mean there's probably like 20 of us that are on the staff rotating shifts throughout the week yeah wow yeah <laughs> it's a lot you come in here at four o'clock in the morning and people are still working you're like oh yeah that's a lot <laughs> well you, you've talked about the lab a little bit and that's actually one of the pieces i mean most of the breweries like you like you said most of the breweries we've been to for this yeah. project they don't have a lab yeah um can you talk a little bit about you know the lab work and what you guys have in the lab and ha how you make use of it yeah um so I guess we'll start with like quality control. So we will take a wort sample of every beer that we brew and we will plate it uh, so we can see if there's any growth. Uh, we plate all of our tanks after they've been cleaned. So we'll do like a swickle sample and that's just to check like, hey, you thoroughly cleaned the tank. Um, plating all of the bright tanks and then also our bottling line random bottles as they come off as well as like anything that's coming in contact with the bottle so we use media to just monitor the growths and every brewery is going to have some type of growth now the numbers and what it is and everything else really matters but the fact is we monitor that every day um then the lab is also responsible uh, which kind of frees up some time for the brewers, but every day we're going and checking turbidity. So like how clear is our beer? And I think one thing you'll notice about Foothills is that, you know, for our IPAs and things like that, they're, they're pretty clear. Uh, and that's just, you know, really detailed standard operating procedures of like how we're crashing our tanks when we're spinning them. And we're just very much on top of that. Keeping daily logs of your gravity, your turbidities, what the PSI is on the tank, what the temperature is. Uh, basic things those labs could do. Now, when you look at the other stuff Foothills does, because we have the balling line, we have some advanced um, calibration machines that we'll use to check out like the CO2 and the dissolved oxygen in our bottles as they're coming off the line. Um, 
we did research on bottle caps and how are they absorbing oxygen or letting it in, you know, to beers to make our product as fresh as possible. Uh, you know, we give 90 days freshness on our bottles and yet you see other breweries who have to go to pasteurization to do 120 days. So we're not pasteurizing our beer. We don't want to get rid of that amazing hop flavor, but we're going to research whatever we can to make sure that it stays fresh and as delicious as long as possible. Um, so we've done all of that research. We, uh, so one of the things that's kind of interesting about us is we actually have a, a yeast propagator. Um, so we'll start with a little package of yeast about this big. It comes live in some wort from the lab and, um, We'll actually put it in a propagator and over the course of 48 to 72 hours, we're actually, um, call it the love motel for yeast basically. We're getting all the yeast cells to reproduce and just grow in volume, um, in which case then we'll pitch it. And we do studies on our yeast every single time and have you know, ruled out that we can actually use our yeast up to five times, like five generations here. Uh, but that's not without like constant monitoring. Um, and that's what I really love about it is that brewing is such a science. And I think if you pay close attention to what you're doing, you can have a great product, you know, regardless of the situation. You really kind of understand how the yeast is working and how your grain is working. So the lab here is, I mean, vertical tests for months out that we're tasting these beers. Um, yeah. Lots of lab work. <laughs> oh, I bet. Yeah, but I mean, we also, like, Wiseman would bring over some of their cans, you know, and we would test those. They had a mobile company bottle for them, and we would just test it and, and say, hey, your cans are good. You know, you got good levels of dissolved, you know, oxygen in there. Good to go. And I think it also kind of, like, just by having that better um, lab kind of invites the community to like hey if you're not sure about something bring it in we'll check it out for you you know i love that it's awesome yeah um and you kind of touched on this a little bit already when you're talking about the staffing but like from your perspective do you have a typical like week that you could describe <laughs> or even just a typical brew cycle i guess might be make make more sense than the week yeah, um, let me just like tell you kind of like what I do during yeah. the week. Okay, so this is completely switching as of August 13th, <laughs> but my typical week is I work Thursday through Monday, um, Thursday, Fridays, well, and on the weekends too. I'll usually jump up on the brew house um, where I'll check in with like the brewer that I may be taking over, like, hey, do we need to mill in? Do we need hops? What do we need? Um, I coordinate the grain pickup with the farmers. So I have two different farmers and if we have a silo fill, making sure the slot is open for the silo truck to come in. Um, so I'll do the brewing side and then on the weekends we also have um, lab work. So I'm the lab person on the weekends. So I will take all the gravity samples, do all the cellar work. I will start a batch of beer in the morning, um, depending on the schedule, because I'll have a guy come in like two or three hours after I get there. And uh, so I might start brewing beer and then I'll hand off the beer to him and then I'll start doing lab work for the rest of the day. And then I'll go and do cellar work based on my lab results. Uh, it's kind of cool, it, lo it allows you to not be bored. That's for sure. Um, but it's also taught me, you know, this side of being responsible and reading the results you're getting from all your lab work and making decisions on what to do with that tank. Um, you know, there's still, there's always somebody you can call and be like, so I don't know about this gravity. I don't know if I should bung the tank. Uh, but it's totally kind of educated me and given me a chance to really say, hey, you know the answer. You're looking at the numbers, make the decision. Uh, which as much reading as you can do, I think until you're put in to that position, you're always like, oh my God, I hope I made the right decision. I hope I don't mess this up kind of thing, uh, which I think helps build a more confident and more aware uh, employee, you know, giving them that responsibility and saying, all right, make the call, Yeah. you know? So yeah, basically, and I mean like yesterday, so yesterday was my Friday. Um, 
we didn't have enough coverage in the lab. So I worked in the lab all day and took like beer samples and plated knockouts and, you know, did turbidities. I did all that. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I love the fact that I can fill in any day and I don't know what I'm doing. Sometimes when I walk in, they're like, could you fill kegs? I'm like, sure, you know? But I love being cross-trained like that where you yeah. could just jump and help out whatever is needed. Um, and do you think that having that kind of cross-training or, it, I mean, it sounds like basically anything that's going on back there, you've had your hand in it at some yeah. point. <laughs> do you think that that, like, how do you think that that helps in terms of making the beer and even and, and talking about the beer like how, how do you think that that kind of factors in I think if you if you only work on the bottling line and you don't know what product is going into the bottle where it's going you know how can you become aware and educated if something is not right coming in front of you you may be the only person that's going to catch it uh, so I think understanding, at least understanding what normal looks like in all the different areas, you know, of the brewery, like, hey, that, you know, bin with the hops, that fan is making a weird noise or this light pops up that shouldn't be on there. Just notify somebody and be like, hey, you know, or, you know, looking at a bunch of grain and saying, well, this, this doesn't look right. This isn't what we normally order, you know, and being able to make those calls. Um, you know, I had this discussion with my mom one time and it was uh, either the frustration that you have sometimes working somewhere and the most amazing thing that could happen is when somebody says, thank you, that was a great catch. It's free, it doesn't take anything. But that person leaves their job for the day being like, yeah, it did something right, you know? And my mom's like, well, do you get a paycheck every week? And I'm like, yeah, but that's not the point. You know, the paycheck is like, well, yeah, you put in your hours, there you go. Um, but anybody that I've worked with where it's like they're giving me a report or like, hey, I milled in this grain, I've always been like, thank you so much for doing that for me. You know, because at the end of the day, they're like, today sucked, but somebody said thank you. You know, um, so I think really being back there and being able to tell anybody like, hey, do you need help on this? Let me just jump in and help you. Uh, or I need this stage, knowing every little aspect that's going on kind of helps just keep the day rolling. You know, if you stay informed of changes and things that are happening, you can set people up for success the rest of the day. Like, hey, I know we're switching hops on this next batch. I, you know, put those out for you. Alpha acid changed, you know. And it makes life so much better when you have people like setting you up for success rather than, I don't know where this stuff is. Good luck finding it. You have to mash in in 30 minutes. Bye. It's eight. I gotta go. You know? And that's always been my goal here is like, no matter what I'm doing, if you need help, I'm glad that I'm at least trained enough where it's like, yeah, I got you. I could drive this forklift for like 10 minutes for you. What do you need? You know? I'll do it. It's fine. Um, but yeah definitely knowing a little bit of everything back there and I think everybody should you should cross train people like crazy because not only are you creating better employees but when you're short in some area you could be like remember that one time go over there and do it you know <laughs> problem solved <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah so uh you've been in Winston since 2015 is that right the end of 2015 yeah so that hasn't been that long ago, no. <laughs> but Winston's beer scene has changed a lot. dramatically yes. since then. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Like what the changes you've seen? Um, I, I think the craft beer scene has changed as far as people are becoming more involved um, in the brewery scene. And I think it's because breweries offer so many community activities. I mean, every weekend or during, even during the week, you have yoga somewhere, you know, um, concert places. So many local bands have so many great venues to play at now because you have all these breweries that are open. Um, where am I going to take, you know, my friends that are coming into town, take them here. Food trucks, so many parking lots for food trucks to go to now. You know, uh, we do, and I know the name is changing, but it's a, a quarterly event we do called Hop Shop. You know, the number of craft vendors, they take up all in here, all out there in the parking lot. You have thousands of people come here. There's food trucks everywhere. But I mean, just allowing even 
local craft vendors a spot that hey you can open up and you can sell your wares for two days you know people love that um so i really feel like winston and i guess pretty much any town where you get a bunch of breweries opening as a whole benefits so much when i remember you know back in Miami they were like no we should only include breweries should only be allowed to go into industrial warehouse spaces nowhere near the neighborhoods with the schools and the children it's like bring me a brewery come on. I want you right next door you know um, that's the way I feel like Winston is really now doing it people like joke and say oh Winston could be like the eastern Asheville of North Carolina. I'm like, no, Asheville's two hours that way. You just go that way. <laughs> I can't afford to live in Asheville. I can afford to live in Winston. Um, but I think as a city, we have nowhere to go but up as far as like the beautifulness that breweries bring in as far as activities and sponsorship of like local things that are going on in local groups and meeting places for everybody in your town you know and if you don't like the one brewery go to the other one because there's like eight of them you know and they're only getting bigger um so yeah i think winston is is smart in allowing the breweries to open up and saying yes and saying please come into our our town um and i mean it also offers a challenge to all the other breweries say oh that that's pretty creative i like what you did there i'm gonna take that i'm gonna run with it over here you know, um, I have a friend who does yoga and she, you know, she's like, she's into aerial yoga. So she does the silks and everything else. And she's like, I don't know. And I said, go pitch your idea to other breweries because there's so many people that are just doing floor yoga. I would go pay 20 bucks to do an aerial yoga class. Absolutely. That'd be awesome. You know, and it's a great space to do it in a brewery. You got all these rafters you can hang your silks from. Um, but yeah, I, I love how different the craft beer scene has gotten in Winston and it's it's gonna get bigger I mean we got other breweries opening up yeah but I mean it and it's not even just the brewery like hey you want to be a tap room there's plenty of beers that you can put on tap and you want to be special and only have North Carolina beers there's enough of them you can have them oh you only want to do 150 mile radius no problem we have those too you know there's enough there is enough and we have room for more so yeah. I Definitely. love Winston. <laughs> um, so let's, we'll switch gears a little bit. You mentioned okay. pink boots yes. a while ago and the importance of pink boots. Um, you know, can you talk a little bit about being a woman in the brewing side of the beer industry? There, yeah. We we found a number <laughs> of folks this summer, but that still it still seems like um, you know anytime someone thinks brewer. They're picturing a dude. Oh yeah, with a beard. I don't have a beard. Um, it's. I always get offended because we're like, I didn't know girls brewed. I'm like, they were the first brewers, you know. I'm like, snap out of it. And I always antiquitate the uh, guys grilling, and it's the woman picks out the cut of meat, she marinates it, she hands it to the guy and says, put it on the grill. She reminds him to turn it, take it off. You know, let it rest, let it rest, let it rest. Cut into it, and the guy's like, I did a beautiful job on this steak. And you're like, yeah, you did, honey, good job. <laughs> so this is why I'm probably single, too. Um, but craft beer has very much been like that. When I was in Miami, I was the only woman brewer that I knew of um, down there. We didn't have a Pink Boots chapter. Um, and whenever I would go to brewery meetings, um, I was like the only girl like sitting there sipping my beer there's all these dudes with beards and like you know brewing tattoos and these are my 12 bottles of homebrew I did last month and you're just like mm, you know uh, and I didn't want to be shy but it's it's hard to kind of like muscle your way into that you know and especially when you're like oh you, did you start off homebrewing and I was like no I was a music teacher <laughs> they're like interesting choice you know <laughs> Um, but then when I moved up here, you know, I kept seeing pink boots, pink boots. And I was like, and a part of me after, you know, battling with the dudes for so long was, I don't need a girl group of brewers. And I think they released some material that I had told, uh, a friend of mine, I was like, I'm thinking about joining pink boots. And he was like, why would you want to join that group? And he sent me a picture and it was like two girls dumping in a bag of grains. And I was like, we 
don't, if, I mean, if you're strong, you shouldn't need two girls to lift a 50 pound bag of grain, you know, or like looking into the work kettle with your hair not pulled back. And I was like, oh no, why would you do that? You know, or pink work coming out. And I was like, that's not supposed, to, I don't know why they would do the word pink. You know, so I kind of had this, like, I want to join this, but none of these images are really true of what a true woman in brewing would be. Um, the other interesting thing about Pink Boots that a lot of women didn't even know is that it, you don't have to be a brewer to join. Um, you know, if you work for Caffey, if you're doing beer sales, you're in. 25% of your income um, has to come from beer. And it doesn't even have to be craft beer. If you work for Miller's or Coors or whatever, come on in. You know, we don't judge like that. Uh, we will try to switch you. But anyways, <laughs> you know, we don't judge. But I've plastered me and a, a, another bartender here, Sydney. She's our treasurer and um, I'm the leader for the new Greensboro chapter. We did a triad chapter. Um, so we literally went and plastered downtown Winston-Salem, went to all these breweries and bars and talked to women and gave them like flyers and we're like, come join us. And the biggest, um, you know, mission with Pink Boots is to support and to educate and uh, to really promote women within this industry that for so long has been noted as, you know, it's a guy's thing. And it's really not. I think women have uh, better palates than men, we are better at catching subtle flavors, I think. Uh, and also there's, you know, that delicateness that girls are like, that's enough salt, honey. And they're like, you know, I can't taste it yet. You know, you're like, slow down, slow down. Um, and then also just kind of like understanding like the fermentation process and realizing like, oh, you got to baby the yeast, like give it a minute, you know, don't, don't freak out if it's not bubbling after 24 hours. Um, but women are also very, um, persistent you know you tell us we can't do something and we're like pretty much any five-year-old like we're gonna open that cabinet one way or another you tell me I can't run a brewery you tell me I can't be the head brewer somewhere and it's like no we will you know uh, and I think that with pink boots they're giving you the opportunity to you can't afford level two Cicerone training or even level one there you go apply for the scholarship there's Siebel there is going out to hop farms or even local, we went to um, Epiphany Malt and I got a tour there. It was the first maltster I'd ever been to. And I mean, yes, it's a small operation, but number one, you take pride because it's your North Carolina you know, area. You're like, this is in my backyard. And then you get that hands-on straight from the guy's mouth, like this is how we do it. And it's just the smell. I mean, he was roasting malt at one point and you're just like, this smells like roasted coffee. It smells so good. So want to stick your head in these really hot piles of grain and you're like, no. Uh, but Pink Boots allows you to do all of that, you know? And the fact is, is like any meeting that we have, we always try to do a educational uh, bit and we open that up to pretty much anybody. So even if like we're going to do here, we're doing um, top five off flavors that you would find in beers which I think if you work in sales or you're a bartender or anything like that, you should A, be trying all the product and then B, be able to pinpoint like, dude, this is off. Now, is it something the brewery wanted to do or is it like, we shouldn't be selling this keg kind of thing? And it happens, but catch it, you know? Uh, but we're, we're educating people here and it's not just open to people in pink boots. You know, you might pay a small fee, but that helps us, you know, it's a donation towards pink boots. Um, so I know that there's been times where it's like, <laughs> I've been really frustrated at work and you know, I kind of I kind of call people on my little support list from Pink Boots and I'm like, this is what's going on. And uh, it's, it's been nice because I have a best friend that I always call and, and vent to, but she doesn't work in the brewing profession and she doesn't 100% understand what it's like and how you know something might be going on and you talk to another female and she's like oh yeah that's not right you know or that sucks let me talk you down off this ledge um so i mean to have a sisterhood that you honestly now are just so proud and you can look across your state and say some of my favorite beers come from these breweries and they're led by women you know love it absolutely love it so i think pink boots if you're any 25 percent of your income comes from beer join it you know there's enough chapters i think opening up now that 
you know, there's somebody close by as a support system and can help you learn, you know, more. Yeah. And I mean, one of the changes in, I guess, North Carolina and Pink Boots recently have been these more local yes. chapters. Can you talk a little bit about the local Winston Greensboro or what, what do you call it? Is it the triad group or? Well, we originally uh, were going to call it the triad, but the problem is, is like when you talk about, oh, where are you? I'm the North Carolina triad chapter. <laughs> where on the map does it say triad? So somebody, you know, put up a really good point, like triad means nothing to me. And I was like, well, all right, we'll say Greensboro because it's that little, you know, triangle. It's in the, it's in the peak, you know, so it's a Greensboro. Um, they recently though, I mean, like Anita was doing the Raleigh Durham and if we were in Winston, we'd drive all the way out there. That was the closest chapter. Uh, Asheville just got formed. Charlotte just got formed. You have Raleigh Durham, Wilmington is opening up. Uh, and you have Greensboro. Um, and I'm sure there's other chapters too that I'm not remembering because there are so many opening up. But I think, um, I, was, I was reading on their website the other day, I think when Pink Boots first formed, there was, God, I want to say like maybe 75 women that, you know, under that premise of 25% of your income um, in that group. And now and we are international. We're not just stateside, but I mean, in other countries, over 250 women and I mean I can easily tell you that number has even definitely gone up uh, as I think women are more uh, are get more interested in craft beer and I think by lowering that threshold of being really intimidated by the guys that know all about the beer and having women beer tenders be like girl you should try this this is awesome you know opening that door and having women actually have the courage to be like, no, I'm going to do this, you know? And my biggest thing is I, I heard somebody say like, oh, I was a woman and you know, the way I looked. And then I would start talking about craft beer. And I was like, you don't even need to look a certain way. You know, guys should respect you. If you open your mouth and you know what you're talking about with beer, it's who cares if her hair is frizzy, you know, and she's wearing jeans and chacos. It doesn't matter. <laughs> uh, but yeah, Pink Boots has played a huge part in, in just having the confidence to kind of just a, approach anything. And they're the one group that if you come to them and say, I'd really like to learn this, like I um, had asked to learn about barrel aging. There's not a lot of breweries that are going to be like, let me teach you all about our barrel program because it's still kind of secretive, like how you get certain flavors out of barrels and your techniques. But to have you know them say, okay, we'll work on getting somebody super knowledgeable in this, and we'll lead a class. I didn't have to pay for a college class; I paid my thirty-five dollar annual membership, and I'm going to learn about barrel aging. You know, I love that. Can you talk about some of the events that the Greensboro Group has done already? Because I know that there've been a few already. Well, we um, the one that we actually just did that was our most recent was. Uh, uh, Christina Hobbs, she's an assistant brewer over at Joymongers, she led the charge in fermentation science basically and so we were actually uh, making uh, sauerkraut and she was talking about the fermentation process and how that would happen with the cabbage and all of that. Uh, we have that off flavor tasting here um, that we're going to do and then upcoming um, a bunch of fundraisers. So the next hop and shop that we're doing, which is the last weekend in September, um, we're gonna be having a booth outside where we're going to sell uh, beer to femme tickets, not tickets, but um, merchandise. And then also I'm kind of doing kind of like a yard sale-ish. We're like, ladies, you know, your winter jackets that you don't like anymore, um, beer glasses, because I'm sure we all have a million beer glasses you know, beer merchandise, things like that, that you want to um, sell, let's have it kind of like yard sale, here's dishes, things like that, but allow people, you know, to buy those items and the purchase goes towards pink boots. Um, at the end of the event, it's a two day hop shop this time, um, I'm actually donate whatever is left over to like a woman's shelter. So regardless of whether the donation benefits us, the donation will benefit some women somewhere. Uh, we also have a local uh, bottle shop, Jugheads, that is October 6th. They're going to do uh, a percentage of 
pint purchases will go towards Pink Boots for like an evening of beers. And they'll have a food truck and things out there. But the big thing that we're kind of looking at is um, a silent auction. Um, so again, more beer to femme merchandise. Uh, one of the things that I really thought was kind of interesting, but um, I wanted to do a brew with a brewster. So if you silent auction and you win that, it would be you meeting with some of the women in pink boots, come up with like, oh, your favorite kind of beer is a wheat beer and you like oranges and lemons, okay. We're gonna brew a beer for you and we're gonna do a home brew setup and actually you know, show them all about home brewing and stuff like that. Um, I also, because we've worked for so many different breweries, but getting some kind of like limited release bottles donated so people can sell an auction on those as well. So I think the big thing right now is just trying to raise some money for a new chapter that just, you know, opened up. Um, so those are kind of some of the events that we're gonna pull together. Um, and hopefully in the near future, I wanted to do a class on sours. <laughs> uh, because so many of us are like, I, I don't like them. I know there's a threshold. There's, there's got to be some sours that people are going to be like, I'm going to hate this and drink it and be like, that was actually really good. You know? So again, it's educating people and changing their perspective on something. Um, so that's a class that I really wanted to organize and get people to speak at yeah. as well. Very cool. Yeah. Um, so if we had a woman wander through right now, she was like, Hello, I want to be a brewer. What should I do? What advice would you give her? Well, first of all, go for it. Um, you know, second of all, kind of figure out where you want to go with, with it. You know, um, one thing that I have noticed working here is that I don't have a creative hand in making recipes here. We have our Footman series, which is going to be opening up again soon with the pub reopening. Uh, but I don't have any control on writing recipes. I don't get to say, hey, this week, let's brew this, you know? Uh, so if you're okay saying, hey, I've got my eight hours, I know I've got to get this done in that time, and you're good at multitasking, which most women are, um, do it. I think a huge thing that we miss out on is remembering that you can do whatever you want to, uh, just how bad do you want it? You know, start out by making sure that you understand styles. I mean, start out beer tending. It's the best way to, A, learn your styles, learn what you like. Um, and then also, you're, you have a closer connection with brewers and everybody that's out there because you will talk to them on an almost daily basis. Um, hang out after work or before work and ask questions. Uh, again, back to the education thing. Almost everybody out there is willing to tell you what they're doing and why they're doing it. <laughs> um, so just learn. If, you, if you're curious, just ask. There's a lot of programs, and that's something that's completely different than Florida, too, but there's so many educational programs that you can go to. I mean, you have Appalachian State has a great two-year program that you could take. Uh, there is Rockingham College that has a program. There is online through Siebel. Um, I think there's another, it's like American Beverage or something that also has one. But there's so many brewing programs that you could take. It's a little bit of money, but it really helps if you can work in the brewery and kind of understand the process. But there's nothing stopping you. You know, don't let a boy tell you you can't do it. You can. Yeah. Yeah. So what would you say is your favorite part of working in the North Carolina craft beer industry? Oh, my God. Probably... The fact that there's breweries everywhere, everywhere. I mean, you want to go to Boone? There's breweries up there. You know, you want to go to the beach? There's breweries over there. Um, and the fact that, you know, people used to or people now plan their trips based around what breweries are in the area. You know, um, and I love too the fact that I'm not very far from Virginia even. So there's a bunch of breweries up there that I would want to go to. But North Carolina. They have beautiful spots and they have a lot of breweries. And one of my, I, I just took a friend of mine uh, this past week, he had never been to the Sierra Nevada Brewing. So I was like, you've seriously never been? He's like, no. I was like, oh, okay. So I drove him out there and his, I mean, he worked with me in Miami Brewing and his face was just like, are you, are, are you kidding me right now? But, you know, also showing him that 
a lot of North Carolina breweries are very environmentally friendly and conscious about what they're doing. You know, we have a recycling for glass, we have recycling for all of our plastic wrap, our cardboard, everything here. Um, our grain is picked up by farmers. <laughs> Aside from recycling our gray water, you know, and solar power, everything else that we pretty much do is recycling. Um, and that's because when you see the size of a brewery, like you have so many waste materials. But I mean, the availability of beer in North Carolina is amazing. And the, I mean, differences. You have breweries that just do English styled ales, you know, that's great. You have German, German style beers at one brewery, that's great. But you can go to all these different towns and they could be real small or they could be real big and you'll probably A, find a brewery and B, they're usually contributing not only to the town that they're in, but also to the environment that they're in. And, um, you know, being somebody who fished and did a lot of water stuff down in Florida, to see people actually care about their river systems and the local things going on is, is so refreshing to me because I used to take kayaks out and, you know, garbage bags with just bottles and things people would throw in the water. And here, a lot of the times, I already see people doing it. You know, breweries are organizing river water cleanups and all of this. So they're very environmentally friendly and there's just lots of beer. So, yeah. two favorite things about North Carolina breweries, hands down. Um, so, we, we've got a couple of uh, fun questions okay. that we like to wrap up with. Oh, man. So, what's your favorite <laughs> beer from Foothills? Um, man. Okay, so if it's an IPA, I'll drink Jade. Um, we redid our Carolina Blonde. We wanted to repackage it for Foothills, and it's now called Thousand Smiles. Um, hands down, my go-to, like, I kind of want a beer, but I don't really want a beer. It's hot outside, Thousand Smiles. So, yeah, we'll go with that one for right now. <laughs> We won't hold you to it. You're no, sure I, to drink other I swear, I drink so many of these other ones. So the the harder question. Yeah. What's your favorite beer from a North Carolina brewery yeah. other than Foothills? I've been dreading this question a lot. Um, so there's a couple. One that you know you can get a lot of different places, but it's just. If I want an IPA and it's a go-to every single day, I could drink it in and out, but actually be Highlands Mandarina IPA. Um, first time I drank it, I was like, tastes like there's orange juice in here. But being a Florida girl, like any fresh orange juice is hands down like my favorite. And then reading like, there's just a splash, just a tiny, tiny little amount. And it's, it would definitely be one of those IPAs that if I had a friend like looking at me sideways, like ugh, IPA, I'd be like, no, you have to try this, you know? I, that's one of the ones you could get somebody to like switch over on easily. Yeah. Yeah. So when you're not here, when you're not brewing, when you're not doing pink food stuff, what are some of your favorite <laughs> things to do for fun? Um, so I have a little Manchester Terrier and her name's Haley. I actually was going to bring her today and I was like, I don't know how they may feel. She's, she's my bar dog. Uh, she just sits with me on the bench and is very chill. Little old ladies love her. Um, <laughs> but I usually will take her for car rides or we go through some of the trails here. Visiting other breweries is always an awesome chance to deal with. But if I'm not doing any of that stuff, um, I do play in the Salem Band, which is the oldest music group since, I want to say 1757, continuously. Um, so we play music concerts in the summer in old Salem Square, you know, um, so playing music with those guys and then really kind of just getting out and seeing a lot of some of the nature that's out there in Florida, you know, I was a water girl and I loved it. I'm Florida native, but that was, you know, I also craved mountains and now I'm 30 minutes and I can go hiking up a mountain if I want to. Um, and just having the ability to get out because obviously when you're in here and it's hot and sweaty and loud, you just want to go somewhere that's a little quiet and kind of like relax and bring it all back in. Um, I've also recently been kind of teaching some friends how to homebrew, which has really been interesting. Um, asking, you know, hey, do you have a hose I could borrow? Well, we could run it out the second floor to 
wait, where does this hose need to go? And I'm like, you have no idea what we're doing, do you? You know? And setting it up and showing them how to homebrew has been like a really fun thing that I've recently been doing. Um, I've also recently been like helping a lot of people pick out beers for their weddings, you know? Sitting down and being like, all right, what are you having to eat? How many people are in your group? You know, how many are we trying to feed beer to? You know, and kind of educating them on different styles and getting them to be like, that beer will be perfect for our wedding. Um, just always kind of educating people <laughs> about the beer. <laughs> so yeah, if I'm not brewing it or making it or cleaning it or packaging it, I might be talking about it and like helping somebody pick out somebody to drink. I don't know. <laughs> Or playing with a dog. Or playing with a dog, yeah. She likes beer. She used to, my last brewery was on like 30 acres, um, and I had a dachshund and her, and they were allowed to be with me at night. So they would go and run the farmlands and like hang out, but anytime you would start draining off that warm wort, that sugary water, they would lick the floor. They're like, oh, it tastes so good. Um, dachshund would jump up in the forklift with me, and we would go dump grain, you know? I mean, just. I kind of feel like that's how it should be, you know, it's a very just organic hangout process, so. Yeah. I loved it. Yeah. <laughs> I wish I could bring my dog here. I really do. <laughs> so that's pretty much the extent of all the questions that okay. I came prepared with. Is there anything we didn't cover that you think would be useful to have kind of as part of your story? Not really. Oh. I mean, yeah, there's, there's not much, I mean, aside from you know, I have no formal education, which I kind of wish I did, you know. It really is one of those, uh, you know, you can make the perfect cake, but you can't tell them scientifically what the baking soda does. Like, that's kind of where I'm at now. So it's just trying to find, like, a good brewing program that I would really want to, you know, put money and time into, but also not be frustrated, like, I already know all of this stuff, you know, kind of yeah. thing. So... Yeah. yeah, that's basically it. I mean, aside from that, it's, I think I've told you everything. <laughs> Chatty. <laughs> well, thank you so much for My talking pleasure. to us. We really appreciate it. I loved it. It was fun.